be at peace with where you are. Always be at peace with where you are while you maintain a healthy sense of urgency every day to make progress towards where you want to go. In Napoleon Hill's timeless classic, Think and Grow Rich, he defines a mastermind group as the coordination of knowledge and effort between two or more people for the attainment of a definite purpose. In this podcast, that coordination is created between you, me, and our amazing guests. Our definite purpose is achieving extraordinary results in your business and your life. I'm your host, Brad Mulvey. Welcome to the Millennial Mastermind Podcast. Welcome to the Millennial Mastermind Podcast, the show for entrepreneurial millennials who are looking for the tools, tactics, and inspiration to take your business and your life to the next level. Today, I'm joined by a guest whose teachings and strategies impact the lives of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world. We are chatting with entrepreneur, best-selling author, keynote speaker, podcast superstar, and overall inspiration, Hal Elrod. I had the opportunity to meet Hal at one of his events, the Quantum Leap Mastermind, last year and was just blown away by his story and his presence within the room. So for those of you who haven't heard Hal before, he is the author of one of the best-selling books on Amazon, The Miracle Morning, which has been translated into 27 languages, has over 2,000 five-star Amazon reviews, and is practiced daily by over 500,000 people in more than 70 countries. When Hal was 20, he actually died in a head-on car crash with a drunk driver where his heart stopped for a full six minutes. But that sure as heck didn't stop him. Fast forward a few years, and Hal is now the host of the highly acclaimed Achieve Your Goals podcast, creator of Best Year Ever Blueprint, which is a live event, and best-selling author of now 10 books, in the Miracle Morning series, which uh, actually even has more coming in the next year. Then in November of 2016, hardships struck again when Hal's kidneys, lungs, and heart nearly failed, which led to his being diagnosed with a very rare, very aggressive form of leukemia. One year later, after the hardest year of his life, I'm thrilled to say that Hal is now cancer-free and more inspiring than ever. So with that, intro. Holy cow. Uh, Hal Elrod, <laughs> welcome to the show. Hey, Brad. Good to uh, connect with you again, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I knew a lot about you going into this podcast, but doing research and reading through even more of some of your experience that I hadn't known before, I'm just so blown away by everything you've accomplished and experienced. So I'm really excited for this conversation. I'm pumped. I love I love your show and I love the topic and uh, you know who you're serving. So uh, this is gonna be great. Awesome. Well, before we dive into some of the Miracle Morning stuff that I'm sure we'll we'll chat about, I do want to start with talking about some of these life threatening experiences or life taking experiences. I guess would be uh, yeah. the more accurate term there. Um, so starting with that car crash when you were 20, would you mind just sharing a little bit of what happened? and how that experience changed the trajectory of your life? Yeah, uh, I, so I was at, at 19, I started selling Cutco cutlery. So I started selling kitchen knives, uh, in-home presentations. I was a DJ on the radio at the time, and that I was living kind of my, or pursuing my dream of being a radio disc jockey. Um, and, uh, but within, uh, my first 10 days, I, I, I broke the all time Cutco record. I was really fortunate. I, I mean, it was really, I attribute the success to my mentor more than me. I mean, he really, he believed in me, he held me accountable. Um, but I, I sold more Cutco in my first 10 days than, uh, virtually anyone had in the history of the company. Um, I think that one person on the East coast had, had, had done more. Um, but at least in my, in the Western half of the United States, it was the most that anyone had sold. So anyway, I made a bunch of money and, uh, I was looking at, I go, the DJ thing's fun, but I'm making like 10 bucks an hour. And I think the sales numbers, my commissions equated to like $300 an hour or something crazy. And I was like, so I, I just, I, I was like, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing the knife thing. I guess I'm going to sell some knives. And a year and a half later, I was driving home after I gave a speech at a Cutco at a sales conference. And I was hit head on by a drunk driver, as you mentioned, um, died for six minutes, broke 11 bones, came out of the coma six days later and was told I would never walk again. And to keep a very long story short, 
um, the, the doctors called my parents in uh, a few days after, or I, actually a week after I came out of the coma. So two weeks after the crash, after my bones were broken, a week after I was out of the coma, they called him in to give them kind of an update on my condition. And they said, physically, Hal's made it through the worst. He's going to be with us for a long time. Because um, at that point, they did, me walking again was like, the, the really the one of their least concerns they just wanted me to be alive you know because mm. I, I actually flatlined twice more during my coma so i was it was very critical condition that i was in and um and uh so they they called my parents and they said physically hal's great mentally and emotionally we're not we're not so sure we're a little concerned um <clears throat> we believe he's in denial and even p- possibly delusional and they said this is something that we see with the accident victims where it's so difficult for him to accept his reality that he's pro- I think we think he's just checked out. And they said, and it's kind of funny, but they said every time we interact with Hal, we being doctors, nurses, you know, therapists, he's always smiling and joking and laughing and he's making us laugh. And they go, that's, that's not normal. You know, for a 20 year old young man who's being told he's never going to walk in, he's got these scars, he's you know, broken bones. And they said, we, we want you to find out how he's really feeling. So my dad came in, explained the doctor's concerns and asked me how I was really feeling. And I said, dad, I thought you knew me better than that. You know, and he kind of looked at me funny. What do you mean? And I said, remember, I live my life by the five minute rule that I learned in my Cutco sales training. And the five minute rule simply stated that when things go wrong and granted, we were taught this in the context of, you know, sales goals. But when things go wrong, such as a customer doesn't show to an appointment or um, you don't hit a sales goal or it's a no sale. Um you can be, it's okay to be negative, but not for more than five minutes. And we were literally taught to set our timer on our phone for five minutes. We could bitch, moan, complain, cry, vent, punch a wall, kick something, whatever. But after the five minutes was up, the only intelligent choice was, well, I, I there's no sense in me dwelling on something that I can no longer change because that energy could be spent in creating the next set of circumstances that I really want. And so um, I said, dad, Uh, My dad's response was, Hal, that was for much milder adversity than never walking again, though. I said, but the principle is the same, Dad. I said, I can't change that I was in a car accident, uh, but I get to choose whether or not that makes me sad, angry, depressed, or whether I I focus on all that I have to be grateful for in my life. And I said, look, if the doctors are right and I'm in a wheelchair the rest of my life, I I promise you I'll be the happiest person you've ever seen in a wheelchair because I'm in a wheelchair either way. So what's the sense in being down and depressed and all the things the doctor said are normal, angry, depressed, sad, scared? I don't see any value in that. That doesn't, that's not going to give me the quality of life I want. I'm in a wheelchair either way, just like we're all in the circumstances that we were, let's say, born into or that happened in our life. You know, there's certain things, in fact, many things that we cannot change. We can't change the past, but we suffer over the past. Think about when you get upset Right, Brad, if you get angry, it's it's usually over something that just happened, right? Whether it just, you know, it happened, now you're upset. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it's it's now in the past. So w- no one ever teaches us this, but we don't, we get to choose our emotional state if we choose it. Most don't choose it. Most let their circumstances or the events or the people in their lives affect how they feel and their quality of life. And I realize that we, we you know, that we actually have the power to choose the emotions that we want to feel in any given set of circumstances. And the only way to do that is first and foremost to accept those circumstances unconditionally without wishing they were different. So I, most people I have, I've heard, you know, when they're in a car accident or they're told they're never going to walk in, they put all their energy into going, this is unfair. I don't deserve this. I'm a good person. And they wish so badly that it didn't happen because that wasn't the plan for them. That wasn't what they wanted for their life. And to the degree that we wish or want for something to be different is the degree that we create emotional pain for ourselves. And we create it. That's the thing is we think negative emotions. We blame them on things outside of ourselves, but they're, it's always self-created by our level of resistance to our reality. So anybody listening, and I'll wrap up with this, I'll just say, um, you know, think about the things in your life that cause you emotional pain. In other words, what's your wheelchair? Right. What's the circumstance either from the past, the present, or maybe it's something in the future that, you know, is is on the way that's not ideal for you. But what's the what's this what's the circumstance or the adversity that you allow probably unconsciously? You don't consciously do it, but you allow to cause or you create emotional pain over that because it's not what you wanted. 
And I, I would invite you to consider that you can accept it and be at peace with it, whether it happened five minutes ago or five decades ago. You can accept it, consciously make the decision to accept it and be at peace with it because you deserve that. You deserve to you know, let yourself off the hook over something that happened in the past. And so that for me was the biggest lesson that I learned is that whether it's traffic, you know, like we usually get frustrated in traffic. Why would you get frustrated in traffic? You can't change the speed of the cars. You're going to be late anyway. There's no value in spending the 30 minutes in your in, in traffic stressed out and frustrated. Like I always say, you can be stressed out or you can be blissed out. That's life. Like every day, every moment, we have the choice to be stressed out by resisting our reality, the reality of uh, you know, a law, something we lost or, you know, my car accident or cancer or traffic, you know, we, we can be stressed out, but that's self-created. And I would invite you to choose to be blissed out because you have that choice every moment of every day, uh, during life. So do you have any advice for anybody who hears that and maybe not for the traffic example, but for the car accidents or the cancers or, the loved ones who passed away who are really struggling with something that is a huge challenge in their life, a huge roadblock. And they, they hear you saying that you can be stressed out or blissed out, but they're struggling to actually put that into play with, with whatever that mount, monumental challenge is in front of them. Do you have any advice on how they can put that into practice? If it's really just seeming to be more of a, a challenge than just flip that switch in their mind. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the what I would encourage you to do is you've got to put it in writing. You know, there, there's we can't trust our memories. You know, we, if you read something that's of value to you that can make an impact in your life, you've got to put it in writing and read it every day. That's I call those affirmations, right? You affirm every day what's important to you, what you're, you know, something you want to remember or act on. Uh, and daily affirmations are a way to ensure that that stays top of mind. So create an affirmation, an acceptance affirmation, if you will. And then there's a couple ways to get there. Number one is implement the five minute rule, right? So do like a 30 day acceptance challenge. That was what I would, that's what I would suggest you doing in, in your affirmations. Um, you know, if you need to go back and there were some things I said that maybe were helpful to you that good reminders, go back, write them down. Um, and then I encourage you to start with that five minute rule, right? Cause that, that, you know, we are, we tend to respond emotionally to adversity roughly the same way every day or every time, you know, something bad. When, like for example, if you're someone that, that suffers from road rage, you know, you get angry or frustrated or upset in traffic, you probably have virtually like if they were measuring, if we were measuring your brain waves, you have virtually the exact same response in terms of what's happening in your brain and your emotions every single time you hit traffic. Now it might be intensified by the consequence on the other side of that traffic, meaning if you if you woke up late, now you're gonna be late to work and you're gonna miss a you're gonna be late to an important appointment with a big client, then that might intensify the emotions. But but essentially it's the same. So here's the point. You have to be gentle with yourself when you're trying to make a change and know that, okay, I've gotten upset over things I can't change for possibly my entire life. Probably just hearing Hal tell me this, and that's why, Brad, I'm glad you asked this because, you know, you're, you're like, it's easier said than done. And um, here, here's what I, I would love to share is, uh, uh, so and this is when I share, when I speak, I share this, this story. After I teach what I just taught, I share a couple examples. And by the way, anybody listening, if you go to YouTube and you type in Hal Elrod Keynote, I've got uh, probably a handful of my my keynote speeches on the site where I go, you know, even further uh, into this, uh, as well as the Miracle Morning and a bunch of other stuff. So you can watch my keynotes. You can actually watch one I gave completely bald, weighing 127 pounds. I'm six feet tall. Uh, in the middle of my chemo, my cancer journey, I had a speech that was booked, and they they wouldn't. Re, they didn't want to reschedule. So wow. I, I, I did it. Yeah. So that, that's actually, that, that'll come up for you as one of those, one of the first speeches, but, um, but here, so here's the deal. So start with the can't or the five minute rule. And then I encourage you to implement these three powerful words. Can't change it. That for me is the reminder that if I can't change something, then as an intelligent human being, what I'm not going to create emotional pain over it. That would be, that'd be silly. I'd much rather accept it, be at peace with it. And then ask myself, what emotional state would best serve me to move forward today or in this you know, area of my life? 
and then I get to choose my emotions. And it's only through acceptance that we unlock the door to emotional freedom. And then when we have freedom from our emotional pain, we can choose the emotions that serve us instead of being you know, controlled by our emotions based on outside circumstances and forces and events. Um, so the can't change philosophy that, in fact, I used to wear a wristband that said can't change it every day because I needed that reminder. Like I said, we can't trust our memory. So I'd be in traffic going, oh, I left late, damn it. The, uh, the cars are all slow, not today, I need to get to my, and then I would, I would on the, you know, holding the steering wheel, I'd look at my wrist and see that bracelet that said can't change it. And I'd go, oh yeah, I'm stuck in traffic anyway. Why would I be upset about it? I'm just going to be happy and grateful and whatever. You know, I'm going to focus on my goal. I'm like, that's what I'm going to do. And so, so I, I gave a speech at a co college. This was years ago. Um, and uh, I got an email from a girl a few weeks after I gave the speech. And she said, um, I'll paraphrase what she said. She said, Hal, I saw you speak uh, a few weeks ago um, and uh, your message about acceptance and that five minute rule and that can't change a philosophy. She said it really resonated with me because my dad died when I was nine years old, which I'm 19 now. So he died uh, about 10 years ago and I've spent the last 10 years deeply depressed, uh, in therapy, seeing psychologists, seeing, uh, I've been on every depression medication that we've tried every single one. None of them have really worked. Um, I've tried to kill myself twice. Um, and she said, I got one of your little wristbands after the speech and it's the first, the last few weeks are the first few weeks in my, in the last 10 years that I've actually been happy. I didn't realize that I was depressed, not because my dad died because, but because I didn't know that I could consciously accept that he had died and be at peace with him being gone. And she said, well, she actually attached a picture to the email and it was a permanent tattoo in her wrist that said, can't change it. She said, yesterday was the 10-year anniversary of my dad's death, and I wanted a permanent reminder that his memory will never again cause me pain, but I've actually attached a new emotion, and that is of gratitude, because of him, I am alive. I have this life, and I'm going to make the most of it, and I'm going to, I, I will, the memory of my dad causes me now to feel love and gratitude that I am his daughter, and nothing can ever change that. And when I got that email, Brad, as you can imagine, I mean, I, I was emotional. I, it was, you know, it was, it was incredible. And I realized that those three magic words can't change it, you know, or that five minute rule or just the, the, the idea of understanding that we have the power to consciously accept everything that's ever happened to us, whether it's as simple as traffic and freeing ourselves from the emotional pain of traffic, which is usually more of a stress, right? Um, or losing arguably the most important person in our life at nine years old and going through 10 years of depression and attempted suicide and in a matter of weeks having your entire quality of life radically transformed by actively implementing that concept of accepting all things that we can't change. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I, I love the can't change it philosophy. So fast forwarding, over a decade later, you've achieved massive success in part due to that philosophy. Um, you've come up with this concept of the miracle morning, um, which which we'll talk about in a little bit. But now you have a family, an awesome wife, two beautiful kids, and you get this soul crushing news that you have this aggressive form of cancer. So how does that change your perspective and how were you able to just as e easily implement that five minute rule? Or is this one that you have to develop new strategies to overcome and to stay positive during uh, throughout that battle? Yeah, so the, the great question. And the, the five minute rule uh, is no longer the five minute rule for me. Uh, and I tell most people this, that most, you know, most people, when I, if I'm, again, if I'm speaking, I say this, I say, how many of you feel like, uh, you know, five, I need more, like, I need like a five day rule to be, uh, give, let me, give me five days to be pissed <laughs> off, you know, at least, at least five hours. Right. And, uh, and usually like half the hands go up, you know, with a smile on their face that they go, yeah, that seems a little short. Here's what happens is that, um, the first, you know, few after the first, you know, couple of weeks of using the five minute rule and literally I would set the timer on my phone. 
and I'd set the timer on my phone. I'd go, son of a, I can't believe that happened. And, and at the at first five minutes goes by and I'm like, I still feel the emotions that I've been, like I said, we tend to respond. If you measure brain waves, it's the same as we responded. So if you've gotten upset over any type of circumstance or adversity that comes your way, um, you're probably going to naturally feel that. So after five minutes you go, I'm still upset, but you consciously say, can't change it. You take a deep breath and you go, okay. And you kind of talk, you kind of coach yourself through, well, I can't change it. So I don't have to be upset about it. Yeah, I kind of feel that way, but intellectually, I'm understanding that there's a better way of, of interpreting this and of responding to this. And here's what happens. So that's how it starts. And after a few weeks, the timer goes, or you set the timer for five minutes and you go, son of a bitch, I can't believe this happened. Oh, man. Oh, oh man. What, how, what am I going to do here? <laughs> and then you look at your phone and you go, okay, I've got four minutes and 37 seconds left. <laughs> and, and you just kind of have this real, you go, I, I don't want to be upset for another four minutes and 37 seconds. Like, why don't I just accept it, move on and get to work? And so the five minute rule becomes, uh, you know, indulgent. And then the five second, you, you realize, I, like for me, I just, I was like, I need time to go, you know, to just curse or punch something or whatever. Just give me a second to go. Ugh! And then I'm, and then I, I realize I can't change it. So I'm not going to even spend five minutes worrying about it. So bringing it to the cancer, I, ex I mean, I literally, in fact, uh, one more caveat to this, the five minute rule became the five second rule and now became what I call accepting life before it happens. It means that because I'm aware that negative emotions that, that hurt us are self-created, I've decided that I'm not going to even spend, that I'm not going to spend any time indulging in those emotions unless they serve me. Like if, if a man accosts my wife in public, I'll pull out a little bit of, you know, I'll pull out some emotion. Right? I'll get a little, <laughs> I mean, so there is a time and a place. And if you want to grieve and feel sad by all means, but, but the, here's the difference. Choose it. Don't be controlled by it. Right. Mm. Choose the emotions that serve you. And sometimes grieving, it serves you. We need or we want to feel that. Um, but, but do it from a place of, power, not a place of, 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 you know, weakness where, where you're being controlled. And so I, I actually, my doctor, when I went and got some tests and I, you know, we, we didn't, I mean, I thought I had, I thought I had pneumonia or something because my lung had collapsed and, or my, I thought my lung, I, I couldn't breathe. And that's why I went to the doctor. Um, well, he calls me back in and it was, he wouldn't over the phone. They wouldn't tell me anything. They said, the doctor wants to see you go over your test results. It sounded really serious, but I didn't, I didn't know what that meant. I lived an anti-cancer lifestyle, like eating a plant-based diet. And you know, I, like, I, I, I didn't think I, it could be cancer it never crossed my mind. And so I went in and the doctor goes, well, Hal, um, and I could tell he was actually stressed out about what he was going to tell me. And I put my hand, I, I comforted him. I said, doc, I said, <laughs> wow. I just want you to know the way that I view life, I accept life before it happens. So you literally could tell me that I'm going to die tomorrow and I'm okay with that because I can't, if I can't change it, I'm at peace with it. And so whatever you're going to tell me, I can handle doc, I promise. And he said, well, you may have cancer. And I was like, oh, okay, whoa, shit. That's not what I was expecting. But um, but I I accepted it. And I called my business, well, I called my wife first. That was a hard call because I knew that she would have much more trouble accepting it, mm -hmm. you know? So I actually, we were both crying on that call, but I was really not crying. For, and I don't say this, and it's not, I don't think I'm cool. Or I'm not trying to brag, but I wasn't crying because I was emotionally distraught. I was crying because I knew how hard it was for her to hear. And that was hard for me. Um. And uh, however, the way that I was responding was really evident in my next two phone calls. I called my business partner, John Berghoff, and I called my good friend, John Broman. Um, I, and I called Berghoff. I said, hey, I, I, you know, Doc says I may have cancer. And he goes, oh, my gosh, buddy, I'm so sorry. I said, no. I said, if I have cancer, it, it, there's a lesson or many lessons that I believe that I will learn from that journey. I will do everything in my power to overcome it. And I will probably write a book or do something to, you know, I'm sure there's some purpose behind this that I will be able to impact more people and maybe in an even bigger way as a result of the cancer. And, uh, and he said, oh, oh, you know, okay. And how are, you know, and I mean, he, you know, so I, I, I was at just, once again, I'm at peace with it. By the way, let me explain something. Being at peace with something doesn't mean you're happy about it. See, happiness is an emotion. And, and emotions are fleeting, right? Brad, you ever been happy one minute and a phone call changed that? Absolutely. 
right? I mean, yeah, of course. Or you're upset and, uh, you know, you win the lottery. Well, shoot, now you're happy, right? But, but emotions are fleeting. Peace is an ever present state of being that kind of is in the middle of emotion. So if you imagine like if you if you if you hold your right hand up to the right, you go, okay, all the you know, kind of wave it around, all the positive emotions are over here to the right, you know, happiness, gratitude, joy, excitement. And then over here, put your hand up to the left and make a little circle with your hand. And okay, over here are the negative emotions. If you then take your right hand and put it vertically and your left hand vertically, and then bring them together heart center in prayer position. And I always say that in between positive and negative emotions is a place that is peace, is called peace. And again, it's not an, a fleeting state. It's an ever-present state of being that when you live and you access it through the power of acceptance, it's unwavering. That state is unwavering. So when you're in a state of peace, it's kind of neutral. You're not super happy and excited, but you're not down, depressed, or angry. You're neutral. And that's where you can intellectually – think clearly to make the right decisions, better decisions than you can if you're emotional. And specifically, you know, the first decision I always make is what, what is, what emotion will best serve, you know, me now and, and where I want to go. I think, was there another part? Was there a question that I'm not answering? I forgot. <laughs> no, no. I, I think that that was perfect. And just talking through how your perspective changed with the cancer. And so my, my thought going into that was, I imagine that it's it's even harder for you uh, now that it seems that uh, I don't know if this would be the, an accurate way to put it, but you have more to lose. You have a family, you have this whole business, but it sounds like rather instead of it getting harder, you've just kind of mastered this concept of acceptance and the five minute rule all of a sudden becomes the, uh, the accepting it before it happens rule. So you're you're even amplifying that skill. Uh, which is what I would call it is because it sounds like something that you've practiced to be able to get to that point. Um, so I think you nailed it head on. Um, with that with that experience of overcoming cancer, you mentioned how right off the bat you looked at it as an opportunity to maybe impact the world, have some sort of positive outcome from that that you can share with the world. Are there any things besides that accepting life before it happens outcome or rule that you that you really mastered that came out of your battle with cancer that could be perceived as a positive or a lesson that you learned that you'll carry with you forever? Yeah, for me, what happened essentially, I mean, the biggest lesson that I walked away with is what matters most. And I think for all of us, there are some universal truths of what matters most. And then uh, there's a lot of individual, you know, I can't tell you what matters most to you. Um, but uh, the two things that, that I came away with that matter most are my health, uh, or I should say our health. I think that's pretty universal because if you don't have your health, if you're dead, none of the things that matter probably, well, who knows? I mean, there's the whole afterlife discussion. So, I mean, I don't want to get too deep here. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but the point is right that let's just say with this life, you know, if you, if your family is important to you or your business is important to you, but you don't take care of your health and then you, none of those things really matter. And I learned that obviously the hard way. So uh, I always said, and I think most of us, if we have like a family, like, you know, I have a wife and children, two kids, and um, I always said my family was number one, number one most important thing to me, right? I always said that, and I always, I believed that. However, my schedule didn't reflect that. And I think for most entrepreneurs, their schedule doesn't reflect that, you know? Um, and uh, same thing with health. I'll give you an example. Most entrepreneurs value productivity at the highest level, and that for me, I didn't, I didn't, wasn't aware of it, but that was what I valued. And here's how you know if you value productivity at the highest level, which I did. Um, if if you're tired, um, Brad, what's your? If you feel tired, what's your body probably telling you you should do? I would say sleep. Yeah, sleep or, or rest at least, rest, right? Possibly right. Sleep or rest. Um, well, what do most entrepreneurs do? And what I did was. I turn to some sort of stimulant, caffeine, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's like that was me valuing productivity above health. And uh, it, it catches up with you. And it will for all of us. How many successful people do you see, right? I mean, we see people that they do get cancer or they uh, they, they dropped out of a heart attack, right? Like you're like, oh, that guy is just like, the, the you know, he's super positive and successful and he's living the dream and, you know, CEO or whatever. And then, and then, and then they have some sort of physical ailment. And Eckhart Tolle wrote about it in one of his books. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, but 
he basically said that we become so addicted to um, achievement that, uh, and if we don't stop regularly, if we don't take care of ourselves through diet, through rest and exercise, um, then then our body will it will give us a sickness or create a sickness within it to force us to rest and take care of our health, et cetera. So, um, so that was a big, the big, you know, big takeaway for me was, was really making sure that health is number one, uh, and then relationships and making sure my schedule is in alignment with that. Um, the, uh, and with my family, for example, you know, I, I play with my kids and the first thing in the morning when I'm fresh versus at, at night after dinner, when I'm exhausted and they get a half ass dad, you know, just like going through the motions, you know, so really just making sure that you keep your, your, what matters most. And by the way, that question what matters most to me is one of the most important questions that you should be asking in the big picture of life, but also in your business and in, 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 in different, every little facet of your business and every facet of your life. What matters most for me to reach the most people? What matters most for me to live the lifestyle, create a business that gives me the lifestyle that I want? Like for me, I realized that, wow, creating passive income uh, is arguably the most, one of the most important business focuses, unless I want to work forever and, and not, and not have the choice. Like, see, I want the choice to, if I want to take a week or a month off and hang out with my family or go on a trip or, or if I get sick, like I got sick with that horrible flu for the first two weeks of this year. Well, or, or no, an even better example. I got cancer last year. So I got cancer um, and I couldn't work for most of the year. I mean, here and there I'd work a little bit, but for the most part, you know, I probably was able to work maybe 15% of my normal work schedule for an entire year. Well, because I had built, uh, you know, my books and, and different re- passive revenue streams or semi-passive revenue streams, um, I actually, my income last year grew. I had the best income year of my life. And, and again, this isn't to brag, but just to really drive home this point that, um, creating, uh, you know, passive sources of income are, I think one of the most important things for us to focus on. And it should always be one of our goals. Um, and it might take 10 years to get, you know, I mean, it took me 10 years to get all that in place. I think Will Smith said it well, it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. Um, so I mean, it was 10 years to figure that out and, and create those passive streams of income. But the reality is, is that's what really gives you freedom, uh, as an entrepreneur and, you know, in, in your life to be able to live your life on your terms. Um, you can create a million dollar business, but if it requires you to be there every second of every day, um, right, then you, you've, you've, you've built yourself a prison that you're kind of trapped in and, and you don't have freedom, you know, uh, to, to, but, but, but again, if you start out that way, that's fine. Um, I used to work, you know, 80 hours a week or whatever. Uh, so, I mean, don't, don't think you have to get to that place, you know, that passive income place now, by the way, I wrote an article. If you, um, if you go to entrepreneur.com, Type in Hal Elrod. There's, um, I wrote an article on 7.1 steps to creating multiple streams of income, something like that. So that's kind of my my basic uh, advice on that. Well, we'll definitely have that linked up in the show notes. And one thing I want to go back to, I think that the passive income stuff is so vitally important. So definitely checking that out after this conversation and recommend to all of our listeners too as well. But you mentioned how now, uh, you've, you've shifted your priorities and productivity comes after health. Uh, and I think it, it reminded me of Ariana Huffington and the sleep revolution book that she wrote and, and this whole movement that she started that, uh, focuses on getting enough sleep. Um, but, but I hear that and being somebody at the early end of my entrepreneurial journey, uh, I think, yeah. well, could Hal have built this empire? He did by prioritizing uh, health or for Ariana, could she have gotten to this level with the Huffington Post and all the amazing things that she's done with without sacrificing things like sleep? And <clears throat> I would just love to get your perspective on that for all of the early stage entrepreneurs who might have a similar thought going through their head. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, I think the answer is, uh, is I mean, I think it's yes. In that, um, first of all, I'll, I'll just, yeah, actually, I know it's yes because I'll, I will tell you that the interesting thing about 
um, about my about me personally and, and my experience with this is, like I said, I was living an anti-cancer lifestyle. I ate a primarily plant, organic, plant-based diet. I exercise every day. Um, I, uh, I mean, in terms of mental health, because of that five-minute rule, I experience you know really relatively little stress because I'm not stressing out over all the stuff that's out of my I'm just kind of at peace with everything, right? So I was living a healthy anti-cancer lifestyle. So the cancer that I got is, again, it's so rare that if you Google it, it's on page three of Google. Like there, there's no data on survival rate. I mean, it's really rare. So they can't even explain how I got it or why I got it. So it's all a mystery. And I just looked at, I, had, I have theories of what could I have done differently that may have um, impacted my health. So now I'll tell you, here's what I did that was not healthy. So I already mentioned one. I did not rest and rejuvenate like I should have. Uh, the other one, and I believe, you know, this for me was a change. See, I looked at, we may never know why I got cancer, um, but I looked at what are the factors that could have, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but what could have contributed to the cancer. And that's what I thought that are in my control that I can change and that I can improve, right? So I was prescribed with ADHD, uh, I don't know, 13 years ago, and I was di or diagnosed with ADHD, sorry, and prescribed Adderall. And I have taken Adderall off and on um, for, you know, for over 10 years. And I basically, I would, I'd like, I'd take a small amount of it for six months, and then I wouldn't take it for a year. And then I'd take it for six months, and then not take it for six months, and take it for, you know, that was kind of my, my, because I always had this, like, thing in my head, which is like, oh, this, this can't be good for me. I don't like prescription drugs, but wow, does it help me focus, <laughs> you know? Um, so uh, I now, you know, I'm now 110 days or whatever. I mean, I, I, I don't know what it is, but it's, I, I, I haven't, I have a tracker in my app, you know, an app tracker for for habits and such. And one of them is, you know, I stopped taking Adderall completely and I will never take it again, you know? So, but that's an example of when I was tired, I didn't rest. I took caffeine or I took Adderall. And, uh, and so that that's valuing health over productivity now, but to answer your question, can you be healthy and also do that? Yeah. Other than that, other than taking Adderall and not resting when I should have the other, you know, 90% of my, my, of, of health components of again, diet, exercise, et cetera. Um, those were all handled at a pretty high level. And so, uh, I had encouraged anyone, uh, any entrepreneur listening to this, uh, get the movie forks over knives. That's a good, I mean, there's a, I could, you know, probably dozens, if not hundreds of resources I could recommend, but forks over knives. Uh, and I think it's free on Netflix. Um, but, uh, forks over knives is a documentary and that is one of, if not the best kind of, eye opening, like, oh, wow, crap. I didn't realize that my, you know, that, that food plays such a major impact. Um, but, uh, but the bottom line is improving our diet. Number one, it, 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 your energy levels are directly impacted by your diet. Think about this. Um, you, you know, people, most people get tired in the afternoon. Uh, and they're, you know, in fact, five hour energy, their slogan is like, you ever get that crash at, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon, mm -hmm. you need to pick up a five hour energy. It's like, no, 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 you just finished lunch an hour ago and you're digesting that crappy chicken sandwich with, with a huge white bread roll, which as Andrew, Dr. Andrew Weil said, bleached flour is the worst thing man ever invented. It was invented during the Great Depression because they could make bread, large amounts of bread for super cheap, but the human body doesn't even make, it's not even real food. It's so processed. That means pizza crust. That means any form of white bread or bleached flour, pasta, you name it. Now, there are alternatives to all of that. There's a great pasta brand called, what is it, Cabela's, I think. Um, but it's made with almond flour and cage-free eggs. It tastes just like the best pasta you've ever had in your life. However, it doesn't have, it's not bleached flour. It's not, it's not wreaking havoc on your body. Um, so anyway... Um, but the point is, uh, if you want to have, if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, you know, time management is often preached, but I really believe energy management is so much more important and managing your energy levels so that you can be in a peak physical, mental, and emotional state to crush your day. 
and a great way to do that. You know, in the Miracle Morning, I, I share my green smoothie recipe, you know, um, and uh, which is, you know, just throw in a banana, some almond, unsweetened almond milk, some handful of spinach, some some sort of fat, good fats like MCT oil, right? It's a great way to start your day. Don't start your day with, it's so crazy. Breakfast foods in our society are like, are it's bleached flour. Like go walk by Starbucks. You got scones, mm-hmm. bleached flour. You've got croissants, bleached flour. You've got, you know what I mean? Like it's crazy. You should not start your day with carbs. You should start them with healthy fats. Um. Anyway, I, I know we got to wrap up in like a minute, so I'll I'll shut myself up here. But there's my answer to your question. No, you don't need to wait. You can be health. In fact, again, being healthy doesn't take a lot of extra time. Um, it just makes gives you more energy, gives you more longevity. And uh, and make you know and puts you in that peak physical, mental, and emotional state to uh, to be a better entrepreneur. Energy management, I love it. So Hal, any parting pieces of advice for any uh, entrepreneurs entrepreneurs who are listening who are just getting started or just thinking about starting their entrepreneurial journey? Yes, I, I do, and it's you know all of us wish we were where we want to be now, right? Meaning we all, we, whether it's, I want to be a millionaire or I want to start a business or I want to be a successful this or that, or I want to be done with this. We, we all have human beings wish and want that we were where we want to be and, and that we, we want to be there now. We have this stress that's con- this constant kind of monkey on our back. That is this stress that, that we compare ourselves with other people or with where we want to be. And, and then, and then we create stress and anxiety because we're not getting there as fast as we want. And one of the greatest philosophies that I ever heard, and I didn't really get it until I lived it, uh, and I think it was Will Smith that said it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. I've heard it from a lot of people. Um, and uh, and what I realized, and for me, that's what it took. It was roughly 10 years after I became an entrepreneur that I finally hit that million dollar in revenue mark, you know? million dollar in annual revenue mark, which was my goal from like, it was my goal the first year. Then it was my goal the second year. Then it was, and when I go, what did I do? I felt like a failure the first year and a failure the second year and a failure the third year. Here's the lesson. Please, I would encourage you to pause this, like write the, rewind, write this down. When you finally get to the place in your life or your business that you've wanted to be and you've been working towards for so long, you almost never wish it would have happened any sooner. Instead, you see the perfection in your journey. You see that all the ups and the downs and the adversity and the challenges, and the, it was all necessary to, for you to get where it is that you, that you get to. And um, because of that, I encourage you to, first of all, write that down and, and reread it every day, affirm it every day, and be reminded of it. And here's the second, the, the kind of the last part of that is, be at peace with where you are. Always be at peace with where you are while you maintain a healthy sense of urgency every day to make progress towards where you want to go. And when I say healthy sense of urgency, I'm talking about a sense of urgency that is not born from scarcity, which is I'm not enough. I'm not far enough along. I'm not as good as that person is. I'm not where they are, et cetera, et cetera. That's a place of scarcity. That's urgency born from scarcity. Have urgency born from your mission. Uh, It doesn't matter where I am because I'm committed to where I'm going. And it doesn't matter if it happens this year or in three years or in five years or in 10 years because I know when, like Hal said, when I finally get there, I'm not going to wish it would have happened any sooner. So stop wishing it would happen sooner right now and just enjoy the journey, enjoy the process and remain on your mission and move towards it every day. Amazing. So the listeners can find out more about you, the books, the podcast, all that good stuff at halelrod.com. Anywhere else that you would point them to uh, check out more, to learn more about yourself and what you're doing? Yeah. I mean, the Miracle Morning book is, it's, like I said, it's the greatest value that I've offered to the world. Um, it, 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 the way it changes people's lives is profound. And 80 per, 82% of, you know, we've surveyed our audience, um, 82% are uh entrepreneurs. So, I mean, it, it seems to attract that group. And we even have a book called The Miracle Morning for Entrepreneurs. But um, I'd start with the original first. But you can get it on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Um, and just, I always tell people, go check out the reviews, you know, see if it's for you. Um, and uh, and then last but not least, and this is, of course, in the book, there's an invitation. But check out the Miracle Morning community. Uh, Brad, I'm sure you'll probably a- attest to this, but it is arguably the most engaged, supportive, I mean, really like loving community 
uh, just of people. And again, 80% is entrepreneurs, but they're supporting each other and, and every day in, in being the best version of themselves. And it's a great place to plug in. So if you go to Facebook, type in the Miracle Morning Community, I think there's probably dozens of them in different countries. There's an Italian one and a French one. and But just the original one is called the Miracle Morning Community. I think there's a little TM at the end of the Miracle Morning so you can kind of differentiate it. But um, yeah, man, that, 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 those are the best places to, uh, to connect. And I, I, love, I check in the Miracle Morning community almost every day. So I'd love to see you in there. Amazing. Yeah. And I will attest it's, a, it's an amazing group of individuals. Highly recommend it to all of those listening. Uh, Hal, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and share your story, uh, the trials and tribulations that you've been through and the way that you've grown from it and just the lessons that you're sharing with the world based on those challenges that you faced are amazing. So I appreciate everything that you shared and I appreciate the time you took here today. Uh, mutual, my friend. Thanks for having me.